Thank you so much, Diana, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm so excited to be here in Pennsylvania with you. Um, I have heard so much about this conference over the years, and it's just great to be a part of it this year. How many of you have been to a Tea Party event, either here in Pennsylvania or in Washington, D.C.? A lot of you have. Um, and how many have been to an event specifically trying to stop Obamacare or to um, be outside of the Supreme Court or on, the, on Capitol Hill? Something to do with Obamacare over the last eight years. Um, as we've seen over the last three weeks, we still are working to repeal and replace Obamacare, and I'm going to come and talk about that in a minute. I'd like to go through first how this Tea Party movement got started, what we have done, how we've been effective, and then how we're going to continue to be effective. It's been over eight years. On February 20th, 2009, Rick Santelli had a rant on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange about President Obama's stimulus bill. He said our founding fathers would be turning over in their grave about the spending that was going on in Washington, D.C. And he said we should have a tea party, just like our founding fathers did. So there were a group of us online who were communicating through Twitter using the hashtag pound TCOT for top conservatives on Twitter, and a group called Smart Girl Politics, and also one other called Don't Go, who started tweeting about this rant. And the next day, we had a conference call. There were about 22 of us on this conference call the next day, and we decided we were going to do what Rick Santelli said and have a tea party like our founding fathers. So on February 27th, 2009, just seven days after our conference call, we had tea parties across the country. They were at noon, local noon Eastern time and 9 a.m. Pacific time. And we complained about the, the spending and talked about fiscal responsibility. At those tea parties, remember, in a week's time, we had 48 tea parties planned across the country with over 35,000 people in attendance. That weekend, we decided we were going to continue what we were talking about with government spending, and we decided to have tax day tea parties on April 15th of 2009. By the time that April 15th rolled around, I had met Diana Reimer for the first time. She was hosting an event here in Philadelphia. We were doing one in Atlanta on top of the one we ha I had done previously in Atlanta in February. And we had over 850 tea parties across the country with 1.2 million people in attendance. And we continued to talk about the overspending and the overtaxation that's going on in our government and the need for the government to leave us alone and to give us limited government. Then we went through the summer of 2009. We um, had a, a protest after cap and trade passed the House of Representatives in June, right before Independence Day. We had Independence Day events. The Obamacare legislation was beginning to go through Congress in the town halls in late July and then especially in August of 2009. Tea Party people across this country started showing up at Democrat and Republican town hall meetings for congressmen and senators, saying they wanted the government's hands off of our health care. And by the time that September 12th rolled around, we had an event on Capitol Hill. We had one and a half million people at that event on Capitol Hill on September 12th. And by the time that that rolled around, we had solidified our three core values. They were fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. Now today we talk about those same three core values a little bit different than we did back then. Today we talk about it in terms of personal freedom, economic freedom, and a debt-free future. But we're still talking about the same core values and the same underlying principles. We continued to show up throughout 2009, and the health care law that was moving through Congress was a large motivating factor for us. 
Americans for Prosperity had an event in November, I believe that it was called the Code Red Rally on Capitol Hill. Many of you may have been at that event. Michelle Bachman on a Friday night on Sean Hannity's television show said, we're going to have an event next week on Capitol Hill on Wednesday. Everybody come, come join us. I don't know if she realized it at the time, but by doing that, by the time Monday rolled around, we'd had thousands of emails coming to us at Tea Party Patriots with people saying, we're going to be there, we're going to be there. I think there were around 50,000 people that day. It was as a bill was passing through the House the first time. And then in November, that was in the House, it moved over to the Senate, and in the Senate, we wound up being back outside of the Senate in December of 2009. And then um, I joined several other groups in um, Nebraska, where Senator Nelson was uh, creating the Cornhusker kickback, and as we were trying to prevent it from passing through the Senate. Of course, it didn't work, but, but we still were there, and that went on all the way through Christmas Eve of 2009. Throughout the Christmas break during that two-week period where most people take time off, we were still working and organizing and paying attention to the health care bill and trying to figure out what is it that we could do to stop this bill from becoming law. And I was getting all of these emails from people around the country talking about the race for the U.S. Senate to fill the seat of, of Ted Kennedy. And I reached out to a few people on Capitol Hill. Now, I'm from Georgia, I live, live in Atlanta, and I, I, I did not know, um, I wasn't as confident, I would say, back then in the way that I was reading things around the country as I, I came to be. But I reached out to some people on Capitol Hill, and I said, is Ted Kennedy's seat going to go to a Republican? And they said, there's no way that's going to happen. Well, a few weeks later, we saw that Ted Kennedy's seat did go to a Republican, and that largely happened because of Obamacare and trying, though not only Obamacare, but for Obamacare to break the filibuster-proof Senate that the, the Democrats had. Um, about that same time, the same time, I think this is an important thing to realize, about that same time that um, Scott Brown was elected, the day he was elected, the Citizens United ruling came out from the Supreme Court, which really shook up how, um, how funding works in America for political speech. And about that same time, like a week later, that's the first documented case of when the IRS began to target groups with the words Tea Party and Patriots in their name. So that was in 2010, very early in 2010. The IRS started setting its sights on, on Tea Party patriots and other Tea Party groups around the country. And then in March of 2010, the health care law, we thought that by electing Scott Brown, we were going to be able to prevent it from being passed into law. But that did not happen, and it went back over to the House for final passage. And that weekend that it passed, which was um, around February, I mean, March 25th or so of 2009, we had an event on Capitol Hill. We'd been on, in Washington, D.C. the week before. And around Wednesday night of that week, we realized we needed to call people back to Washington, D.C. again. Now, remember, we'd been there in September and November and December, and now we were calling people back again in March. And we didn't know quite what kind of crowd to expect, but we went ahead and did it. A large group of coalitions had an event that day. Tea Party Patriots organized it, but it, it was a, a joint effort with conservative groups and center-right groups from around the country working on it. We had over 50,000 people on the lawn the Saturday before the bill was finally approved through Congress to move over to President Obama's office. 50,000 people. And last week, 
I went back and watched several of the videos from that weekend as we were watching the bill that was moving through Congress in the last couple of weeks about Obamacare repeal and replace. We were chanting throughout the day, kill the bill, kill the bill, kill the bill, and doing everything we could to make Congress listen. One thing that we were able to do is have them on record taking a vote. They wanted to do what's called deem and pass through committee without actually taking a final vote. We did prevent deem and pass from happening, so the people who voted for Obamacare were on the record that last vote. Those 50,000 people stayed all day long. I got there early that morning, around 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning, and people showed up, and they, they just wanted to speak. And so we opened up the microphone and let people start speaking before the event officially began. This woman who was a nurse said, please, just let me speak and tell people how bad this bill would be for health care and the quality of health care around the country. I didn't know her, I'd never seen her before, and I said, okay, you can speak for two minutes, don't mention any candidate names, there can be no campaigning, and if you do something wrong, we're cutting your mic off. And then another person came up, and another person, and another person, and we just had all of these people who came up and spoke for one to two minutes about how they did not want this bill to pass from an open microphone on Capitol Hill, and somehow we did not have anyone who said, they wanted to um, blow up the White House or fantasized about doing that, like what happened with the Women's March the day after the inauguration of this year. They just were passionate about the issues. Many people spent the night and came back the next day where we still had several thousand more people showing up. Some of them spent the night in their cars because they couldn't afford $400 a night for a hotel room. And they stayed all day long on Sunday. And they were there in, on Saturday, some of them from 8 o'clock in the morning until after midnight. They came back on Sunday morning around 9 o'clock in the morning we started. And they stayed throughout the day. When it was evident that the bill was going to pass and the um, Congressman Stupak had caved and made a deal, I went and told everyone, there's been a deal, because I, I had been updating everyone that, with the updates I've been getting all weekend. There's been a deal, and this is going to pass. So I want to make sure you know, and if you need to leave, go home. Go on home. Don't feel like you have to stay. But if you want to stay until the bitter end of this, we're going to stay. We're not going to leave and, and let this pass without having a presence. And I remember at that time saying, we're going to find a way to repeal this. I have no idea how we're going to do it, but we've repealed a constitutional amendment in our country, and that takes a, it's a far higher bar. We're going to repeal Obamacare. So take heart in that. Stay with us if you can. If you need to leave, go on. We understand. We stayed throughout the night until it passed, and that night as it passed, I watched videos of it this past week, and there are still thousands of people out there yelling, kill the bill, kill the bill, kill the bill, kill the bill. Of course, it passed into law. And I'm highlighting this for you because I think it's critically important to understand the passion that existed that weekend. We had people flying in from California. There were people there from Hawaii. I met two World War II veterans that weekend who came up to me with tears in their eyes saying, I fought these kind of things when I was younger and I will do this with my dying breath for our own country. The people who were there slept in their cars trying to make their voices heard. And they realized that simply making their voices heard was not going to be enough. And so they went home and they got organized. And they continued to show up, but they showed up in different ways. And the IRS began targeting us and silencing our speech. And we had to watch the things that we said. And by the time that 2012 rolled around, we could not even use the word Obamacare at Tea Party Patriots the six weeks prior to the general election because our attorneys said that it might be interpreted as campaign activity. That's how deep the targeting went.
But we didn't let it stop us. We did not let it deter us. We continued to show up, and we continued to work. And those 50,000 people went home and got organized. They came to events like this and learned how to campaign. They, many of them stepped up and ran for office themselves. They helped other people run for office. If they lived in very red or very blue states or districts, congressional districts, they helped people in other parts of the country. And they worked to help deliver a Republican majority based on our principles in the House, and then realized they could not repeal Obamacare without a majority in the Senate. So they continued to work on that, and we got it in the Senate in 2014. And then we realized that, again, we could not repeal Obamacare unless we had the White House, and we continued to work on it. Now, by the time 2016 rolled around, Tea Party Patriots had a super PAC, Tea Party Patriots Citizens Fund. And in that super PAC, we, we worked in 2016, once it was evident that Trump would be the nominee, we started making a plan for how we could get Donald Trump elected to be President of the United States. And our efforts focused right here in Pennsylvania. We realized Pennsylvania was the gateway to the White House. It was not going to be Virginia that did it in 2016. We wound up with the help of volunteers from around the country, especially in California, where so many times they feel like they can't do anything to make a difference locally, making over 2 million phone calls into Pennsylvania, Florida, Ohio, and North Carolina. We had people who wrote personal voter-to-voter -voter letters, over 100,000 personal voter-to-voter -voter letters from around the country into Pennsylvania. We did over 6.7 million robocalls. We did over 500,000 pieces of mail in Pennsylvania, and we knocked on over 100,000 doors. And you delivered the vote. And you helped save the rest of the country in November. And we got President Trump elected. It, and it wasn't just, and I, I have to say this, it wasn't just Tea Party Patriots Citizens Fund. We did it together. It wouldn't have worked with the work you're doing at things like this where you're learning how to campaign and the importance of going and getting out the vote. And we made a difference. And we've already seen the fruits of that. We have a president who's determined to secure our borders. We have Judge Neil Gorsuch, who's going to be confirmed to the United States Supreme Court. And we need your help with that next week, because Senator Casey needs to vote to confirm Neil Gorsuch. So it's going to be very important next week as it, the, it moves from committee on Tuesday throughout the Senate the rest of the week for final confirmation, hopefully by next Friday. And we have a president who's working to reform taxes, and he's working to repeal and replace Obamacare. Um, in the last three weeks, as this bill came forward, there were some things about that bill that really concerned people at Tea Party Patriots. And they concerned other groups as well, and I'm going to focus on what concerned Tea Party Patriots. When the bill first came out, the way that we operate at Tea Party Patriots is we send out um, surveys to our membership, and we ask them to help us know what, what side of an issue to take. A lot of times it's only our local leaders, but on this issue it's so important we send it to all of our supporters. 92% were originally opposed to the bill, and after the manager's amendment last week, 91% were still opposed to it. They were concerned because it was not repealing all of Obamacare, especially the parts that would impact the costs the most. These are called the insurance company mandates. There are about 12 mandates in Obamacare. And the bill that Paul Ryan and the House leadership introduced repealed two of the mandates, the individual mandates and the business mandates, two of the 12. Now, they said they couldn't do more because of the reconciliation process in the Senate and the Senate parliamentarian. And that's why they couldn't do more in 2015. But with the change of the presidency, the vice president can be the presiding officer of the Senate and ignore the advice of the parliamentarian. Plus, coupled with a replacement that was going to be giving out tax credits to help people buy insurance, repealing insurance company mandates that affect the price of insurance would affect 
the federal budget. So we contended and still do that that could be put into the bill. There are three specific areas where the insurance company, well, four that you've probably heard of. One is the 26-year-old adult children. I haven't lost any sleep over that. I think it's kind of odd that a 26-year-old can be an adult and live on their own and they still are on their parents' insurance, but I, I'm not losing sleep over that. Then we have what's called the essential health benefits. The essential health benefits are the package, the 10 things that every insurance policy must have in it. If the insurance policy does not have it, it's not allowed. And those things are what's driving up the cost of insurance right now. You cannot go get an insurance policy that only is catastrophic insurance, even if you want to because of that. And what's called guaranteed issue. I have to hurry. I'm going to do this very quickly. Guaranteed issue is what people consider pre-existing conditions. Now, if you know that if you're a healthy person, and you can maintain the, the insurance that, or the normal medical costs that you have, and that if you were to get cancer or some other serious diagnosis, and the health insurance companies must cover you, would you consider to purchase insurance at seven, ten, twelve thousand dollars a year for premiums? plus five, six, seven thousand dollars or more in deductibles, or would you save that money? I think a lot of people would wind up realizing they could save the money, pay for out-of-pocket expenses, normal routine care, and then the day that they get a serious diagnosis, they go and get insurance. The problem with that is that the, if people drop out of the insurance market like that, those who stay are going to wind up having increased costs. And the people who need it most, the irony of this is that the people who need it most at that time are those with pre-existing conditions. And they're going to stay in the market. So their prices are going to go up. If they can no longer afford insurance, then their care, the quality of health care, is going to decline. Do you think that if that happened in this country, the Democrats would use that against President Trump and the Republicans to try to defeat them in two years from now or four years from now? That's what we've been trying to protect against. We're not doing this to harm the president. We're actually doing this to try to help the president. And that's what the House Freedom Caucus has been working on. They wanted community rating, which has to do with how insurance policies, prices are determined, and the essential benefits repealed. They'd conceded on every other mandate. There were two that were in there that were going to be repealed. They wanted two more added in exchange for a new entitlement program with tax credits and continued Medicaid expansion and all the rest left in there. These men and women were standing up not just for us, for those of us who asked for repeal. They were standing up for every American. And they were looking out for those with pre-existing conditions and those who truly need health insurance. And they are looking out for President Trump and the Republican majorities. I just want to make sure that you understand that that's what we've been trying to do. We're going to repeal Obamacare. I have no doubt about it. We <laughs> Unfortunately, it's going to take a little more time than we'd like, but we're going to get to a point where we, we repeal it. President Trump has made promises that he will repeal and replace, and he intends to do that in a single bill. So that's what we should expect, as much as he can in a single bill. He wants to make sure prices go down. And the House Freedom Caucus is looking out for that. And he wants to make sure that he cares for those with pre-existing conditions. And there are ways to do that through a free market system and our charitable country so that, we, that that can happen. And we're going to be able to help him achieve his goals and help those of us who did not want the government to control our health care to get it out as much as we can. And we're going to be at a point where we are closer to having more personal freedom, economic freedom, and a debt-free future in this country. Thank you for allowing me to share with you a little bit about the passion that went into this health care fight over these years so you understand the passion that happened over the last three weeks. 
and thank you for letting me tell you a little bit more about what the House Freedom Caucus is trying to achieve right now. We will repeal Obamacare as long as each and every one of us continues to show up and as long as we have a dialogue and work towards the end goal. And I have no doubt that with people like you all across this country joining those who are showing up, we're going to make a difference. Thank you so much for all you do for your state. Thank you helping deliver Pennsylvania for the rest of the country in November. And thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful weekend this weekend. Continue to show up.